What's going on guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel. Today your Pathfinder playtest coverage continues on with another episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit as if I didn't talk about the Magus Magus, I prefer to pronounce it the other way, but I'm probably wrong. In Pathfinder First Edition, we're here again today to talk all about how you, yes, you can play a spell sword in Pathfinder Second Edition, and we're building it on the chassis of the sorcerer. If you guys are liking what you're seeing, remember, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, spread the word, spread the plague, and today, we're not gonna shout out a patron again here at Min Maxing for Fun and Profit going to take a little bit of a left turn here. This episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit in your Pathfinder playtest coverage was brought to you in part by Wheel or Woe, a Pathfinder playtest podcast, say that 10 times fast, that you can find at podbean.com. I'll leave you a link in the description. And I will also say that as of today, a uh, year and a month and some change into my time as a YouTuber, for the first time I feel that it's gone full circle because I know one of the players at Wheeler Woe from this channel and they shout us out in their Session Zero video and like, I'm not even kidding. If I were to step out of my apartment right now and a meteor were to strike me dead and like leave a crater in the parking lot, that would be worse probably. But if that were to happen, I would feel like I lived a complete life because that thing that I really enjoy doing and bringing to you guys, I've helped someone else get into it. Oh, by the way, they're a blast to watch. The audio is really crisp. You get to learn their favorite brand of LaCroix really early on, so that's great. So if you guys are into listening to your Pathfinder live play, follow the link in the description. Go check them out. It's a blast. Tell them Tommy sent you. Now, anyway, sorcerer time. Okay, so like I said, this is going to be recreating kind of the Magus in the Pathfinder playtest. We're building what's known as a Gish. That term originates from D&D, &D, where originally it referred to a Githyanki fighter wizard combo. Essentially, it's a character that's both skilled in physical combat and in the use of magic. In Pathfinder First Edition, leading the charge and spell striking all the way, through the art of the Gish was the Magus with the ability to put a touch spell on the end of your melee weapon and have it use that weapon's threat range and crit for days with a 15 to 20 katana or something and then your shocking grasp those oodles of damage and oh oops he killed another thing. It was really powerful and I was kind of bummed out personally myself as the playtest preview content came out and we saw that we would get the Alchemist but not the Magus as a core class. Don't get me wrong, I think the alchemist is cool, but just like I really enjoy the art of the spell sword. But in the Pathfinder playtest, literally anyone and everyone, every class to some extent, can be a Gish. Now, let me tell you why. It's no longer a base attack system, first off. It's proficiency. The sorcerer who's only ever trained in, say, like a short sword or whatever simple weapon at 20th level will only be adding, assuming the same gear and the same stats and stuff, three less than the person who's got legendary proficiency with the same weapon. And there's no longer the issue of how many attacks will happen in a full attack action due to high base attack. Because again, proficiency system, the gulf has narrowed. That was one of the big hangups in Pathfinder First Edition was like you could play a sorcerer and you could play a melee sorcerer. I've been in parties with melee sorcerers. They can be very effective, but it's a lot more difficult because your base attack was just so much lower and you'd fall off. Secondly, in the Pathfinder playtest, I forget how many monsters there are, but not all of them have the attack of opportunity reaction, especially at lower levels. I've learned this playing Doomsday Dawn when a little flying thing goes flying throughout the party, only the fighter can try to swing at it, or when hyenas are circling, no one can do anything about it. Ergo, casting a spell in someone's threat range is considerably less dangerous in the playtest because again, there's no attack of opportunity most of the time. Now, if your GM decides he wants to respond to your character by an army of human fighters or devils, all the devils have attack of opportunity reactions, that's one thing. But a lot of stuff, again, just doesn't have it. So right now, the playtest meta is really good for 
the Gish. Through the use of archetyping, everyone can get spells. Getting to 16 intelligence is not nearly as hard as it used to be with the way ability score increases work now. The wizard archetype hands you spells. You don't really need that high of a DC. You're just rolling touch. And then you're throwing D12 shocking grasps at people. Yeah, right, that's terrifying. So like I said, literally everyone can do it. But today, it's the sorcerer. Now, before we talk about the finer points of the sorcerer, the spells, the bloodlines, etc., etc., let's talk about the basics. If this build, if this style of play has any kind of weakness, that weakness is purely the fact that we don't have a lot of hit points. We're 6 plus con every level as a sorcerer. We're the lowest hit die in the Pathfinder playtest. We're really just happy we're not a D4 anymore, to be honest with you. So when choosing a race, I had to choose something that would buff my con because we just need it. And also at the moment, the only way to do dex to attack and damage is to literally be a rogue. Archetyping into rogue does not hand it to you, which to be honest, I was a little disappointed by. In the Pathfinder playtest with the way archetypes work by the same notion, the fighter archetype doesn't grant shield proficiency. It's a much more stingy meta. Abilities define the classes a little better, so we have to have strength. Kicking myself for saying this, but I was thinking about willingly building a gnome because the gnome does have that eight racial hit points and it buffs the stats we need, but it's the strength neg that we don't like. So today we're building a human. We chose constitution and charisma as our two bonuses. The background and stuff we aren't going to worry about too terribly much, but our stats end up with 16 strength, 12 dexterity, 14 con, 10 intelligence, 12 wisdom, 16 charisma. Now for a while it was 18 strength, 14 charisma, and for a while it flipped back around as well. But in the Pathfinder playtest, our ability scores increase by twos, as long as it's less than 18, and they increase in multiples, so it's a little more intelligent, in my opinion, from a min-maxing perspective, and I kind of regret not doing this on Octarian now, in hindsight, over at Broken Universe, but it's better to not start at 18 and just wait until you get to level and you can pad up there in such a way that... Your other ability scores aren't neglected, you know, like our con, which we wanted to put at 14. It's kind of like along the same lines of in a 15 or 20 point buy in Pathfinder 1st Edition, where things were a little stingier, you might set an important ability score at 17 instead of 18, save those three points, pad something else, and then at level 4, bump the important thing up to 18. It's the same idea. Now, backgrounds aren't super important, skill feats aren't anything we're going to really talk about today. Because that's more flavor, that's more what your campaign needs and what you want your character to do in downtime. Really, it's all about just how to do lots of damage with a sorcerer. And the first question we have to ask is what bloodline, what spell list? Because really, my favorite thing about the sorcerer and the reason I'm theory crafting so many sorcerers in my head is they get access to every spell list by virtue of their bloodlines. A fae sorcerer casts like a druid, an angelic or demonic sorcerer casts like a cleric, draconic and imperial cast like a wizard. That's, that's weird. That's still really weird for there to be a distinction in my mind between the wizard and the sorcerer, but I really like it. Aberrant bloodlines cast like a bard. For our bloodline today, we've chosen to have access to divine spells, and we've chosen demonic. Now, it was really close to Angelic. A lot of the spells this build is choosing are on the Angelic Bloodlines granted spell list, but we're choosing Demonic really for one and only reason other than, you know, Disintegrate and Meteor Swarm, which are both super fun, and Slow, which is as good as Haste was back in the day. That's a very relevant, very powerful spell. What we're really looking at here is Glutton's Jaws. Glutton's Jaws is our first power. It takes two actions, and it turns our mouth into a shadowy maw, bristling with pointed teeth. It gives you an unarmed attack that you're trained in, and it does a d6 of piercing damage. And if you use that attack against living targets, you gain 1d4 temporary hit points. Of course, these automatically heighten, and you get extra heightened things, but that's the theme here. Because our class's HP is less than, like, the Barbarian and the Fighter that are standing next to us as we hold the line. That's one of the two reasons that we chose the Divine Spell List as the spell list for our Gish, because the Divine Spell List has access to heal. Not only can we serve the role of the party healer if we so decide, we can spend an action to heal ourselves and then go back to Gishin 
which is super good. It keeps us in the fight longer, could take them out faster. It becomes more of the long game than the short game, which is relevant. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, it appears to me that it's going to be a lot harder to just run up to a thing and alpha strike it to death. Granted, there's a lot of D12s being thrown around, but things seem to have a lot more HP. Things seem to have more resistances. Our hit points are always going to fall off in the presence of like a troll or a human barbarian or a troll barbarian or a frost giant or whatever. So our Gish is playing a bit of the long game. Now reason the second to play on the divine spell list is the opposite of heal, it's harm. A lot of spells in the Pathfinder playtest take two actions to cast. I learned this in Doomsday Dawn when I had a half-elf sorcerer when Nathanos would ray of frost the thing and then fire afterwards with his crossbow. It dawned on me right then that literally everyone is a gish if they want to gish. Gishing is just part of the meta. It's no longer a class. And again, optimizing in the Pathfinder playtest is less about how much damage can I do right now and how much can I do with my three actions. Just like heal, harm is a spell that has three actions that you can spend to do a different thing, but normally it's just one action, one somatic casting. If we do somatic and verbal, it's a range of 30 feet, a range touch. If it's somatic, material, and verbal, or us as a sorcerer, somatic, somatic, verbal, it's a burst, but one action makes it a touch attack. Though it's not necessarily grab all of your friends' D12s. Seriously, that might be my favorite thing about this playtest, is the D12 is relevant in high numbers. It's so cool. Never have I ever, ever seen that many D12s thrown at a table at once. Rather, we spend one action to move up to them, one action to cast harm, deal 1d8 plus your spellcasting ability modifier in negative damage to a living target, and then after some things trigger that we'll talk about in a second, use that second action to ram them in the face with a long sword. Or, honorable mention, we didn't go with it. Once you're already up there, use an action to cast harm, use an action to use a shield bash with the boss on your shield after you get shield proficiency, then use an action to raise your shield. You're still dual wielding, you're still gishing, but again, that's the first rule of the Pathfinder playtest. The Ring of Protection is a lot bigger than it used to be. Of course, us, we intellectuals, we spellcasters, I have to talk this way so you guys don't think that I just cast greatsword everywhere, can cast shield for one action, but the shield has considerably less hardness, and after it's dismissed, you can't use it again for 10 minutes. I feel like that's a little worse than having an actual shield, but that's what we decided to go with today. Now, let's talk about some feats, shall we? The human has a lot of really cool things that we can get our hands on in the Pathfinder playtest. Usually, I feel like it's a cop-out when I'm playing a human. I don't really like it. I never liked it in Pathfinder 1st Edition unless literally we were playing on Galerion because then, like, I wasn't human, then I was Chelish, or Mawek, or Osiriani, etc, etc. But here, our ancestry actually gives us a lot of fun, toolboxy kind of things. First up, right out the gate, as a human, we're taking the ancestry feat, Adapted Spell. Adapted Spell reads, choose one cantrip from a spell list other than your own. If you have a spell repertoire or spellbook, replace one of the cantrips you know or have in your spellbook with the chosen spell. If you prepare spells without a spellbook, like if you're a cleric or druid, one of your cantrips must always be the chosen spell, and you prepare the rest normally. As a divine spellcaster, we don't have a ranged option, so we're taking this and we're grabbing Ray of Frost, because 1d8 that eventually becomes multiple d8s plus chop means we don't have to worry about like having a longbow, or having a crossbow, or having like a throwing knife, or enlarge personing and throwing the halfling at someone. When we're out of spells and we need to be away from the front line, we can still ping with Ray of Frost. At fifth level, of course, we are taking Natural Ambition, which allows us to gain a first level class feat for our class. As the sorcerer, can you guys guess what it is? Can you guess what we're taking a little while to get? I bet you can. We're using natural ambition to pick up our familiar. Of course, the familiar has a lot more mechanical use to the sorcerer because it's extra spell slots for us. So on like combat days, that's probably how you're prepping it, but I will never shut up about how versatile and valuable something like a familiar can be. It's always relevant. 
We'll talk about our general feats in a second, but spoiler alert, we're getting adopted by halflings. At ninth level, we will take the lucky halfling reaction because re-rolling's really strong and we don't need to be adopted by gnomes to get a familiar this time. There's no reason to not. Then it's general training twice to grab a first level general feat, that being lightning reflexes and die hard. yippee ki -yay. So lightning reflexes is still a buff to our reflex save, but die hard says we die at dying five rather than dying four. Again, since our hit points are a little less than everybody else's with our d6 hit dice, even with a padded con, it's relevant. We gotta grab this. Speaking of that, as we transition over to general feats, toughness is the first one we choose. For that exact same reason, I feel like it's as required, if not more, for the gish with not a lot of hit points as it was for first edition's kineticist. In the playtest, toughness says you increase your max hit points by your level or four, whichever is higher. When you reach level five and every time you gain a level, adjust your maximum hit points gained from toughness accordingly. Eventually, this is a pool of 20 extra hit points. When we take it, it's an extra four, which might be the difference between dying to a goblin's rusty horse chopper or, you know, just being upset that we got cut by a goblin's rusty horse chopper and then casting heal on ourselves. Regardless, at seventh level, we are adopted by halflings. Then it's alertness, incredible initiative, great fortitude. Alertness takes us to expert on perception. We're only trained as a sorcerer, so that plus one seems super relevant. Great fortitude and, well and truly, lightning reflex as well. Takes our saves and makes us expert proficiency at them as a sorcerer. We're expert in will, but we're trained in fortitude and reflex, so it's super relevant for us to grab great fortitude and lightning reflexes just as soon as we can to pad our ability to not die horribly. Think of it this way. Lightning reflexes could be the difference between a critical fumble on a fireball at our face and just a failure. It's a 5% chance to skirt the edge, which is super relevant at all times. Now, let's talk about our class feats, shall we? The thing I like most about the Sorcerer is the thing I like the most about the Sorcerer in Pathfinder 1st Edition. All of my casters, though I didn't play a lot of casters, really they were magi for the most part, would always dip sorcerer, they would always dip cross-blooded sorcerer, and they would choose orc and draconic as their bloodlines to add a modifier to the damage dice that they're rolling when they're, you know, fireballing your face off. The first class feat we're taking is dangerous sorcery. When you cast a non-cantrip spell that deals damage and doesn't have a duration, you gain a conditional bonus to the spell's damage equal to the spell's level. And remember, a lot of our spells that are relevant are going to be heightened. So eventually, if you use a 10th level spell slot for harm, 10d8 plus 10 worth of damage in one action, and then here comes 5d whatever you decide your melee weapon to be. And it's, again, just really strong. Though I feel like this is a game that... We're trying to play the long con a little more in. We're trying to drain their hit points, heal our hit points, last a turn longer than the bad guy is. That modifier is still relevant, especially because a conditional bonus to spell damage won't often happen. Anywho, at second level, we take our dedication of fighter dedication. Now, some people may argue that, well, we're not a pure sorcerer anymore because we've taken this fighter dedication. We've taken an archetype. I propose that archetypes should no longer be considered changing your class so much as the dedication is a prerequisite for access to certain feats. We might not necessarily take it, but a lot of builds in a lot of different styles of play in Pathfinder 1e would take power attack, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah they would. Now that's a fighter feat. Same with Furious Focus, same with Combat Reflexes, though we don't ever get access to that. You get the idea though. This is the only real, like, feat tax in the build is to take fighter dedication. And even then, that grants us proficiency with a bunch of really cool armor that grants us proficiency with a bunch of really cool weapons. And remember, armor doesn't play a role in spell failure now. Getting access to all the martial weapons is super relevant for us as well. Really, I'm going to leave your choice of weapon entirely 100% up to you. I won't say what's really good, what's really bad. Though this means we could have a bastard sword in one hand and harm in the other, which doesn't sound bad, and I won't say don't do that. I still feel like... The Agile weapon is going to win out here, something like a hatchet or a short sword. 
a light hammer, something that does a d6 of damage but's a little better at hitting, seems to come off better for me in the end, at least at low level play. If you end up just overwhelming things as time goes on, so much the better. And again, having a shield in one hand with a boss seems pretty good because you could just break someone's nose and then raise it. Anywho, enough about that. At level four, as soon as we gain access to it, we grab Magical Striker. It's a free action. It's trigger. You finish casting a non-cantrip spell on your turn. You siphon residual spell energy into one weapon you're wielding. If the weapon is non-magical, it becomes a plus one magic weapon. And one that's already a magic weapon increases its bonus by one. This benefit applies only to the next strike you make on your turn and is wasted if you don't strike by the end of your next turn. You can gain the benefit of this only once per turn, so the idea is harm, magical striker triggers your weapons a little better, put a hatchet in their face, and then you have your third action to perhaps attack again with an agile weapon, take that minus eight, move out of the way, try to cast another thing, heal yourself if you need to. Seems really good to me. Now, one thing that struck me, and really this only struck me at the very last minute as I was making this build, was that as a character, we're oftentimes going to have one hand free and be wielding a one-handed weapon. These class feats always seemed really bad to me as the fighter, because like, why wouldn't I just have a shield, right? That seems really relevant. For the gish, it's super good, because literally our homeostasis is one weapon in one hand, usually nothing in the other. So. At level 6, we take our basic maneuver fighter feat, and we're going to grab Dueling Parry. Yeah, right? This isn't necessarily as good as a shield, because Dueling Parry doesn't have hardness. It doesn't give you DR at low-level play. It doesn't just guarantee your ability to not take damage from attacks that's so amazing at low-level play, let me tell you. But for one action, when you're wielding only a single one-handed melee weapon, and your other hand or hands are free... You get a plus two circumstance bonus to AC until the start of your next turn, as long as you continue to meet this requirement. So harm, trigger, slap, dueling parry. It's not quite as good as a fancy shield, but it's still there and it gets better. But before it gets better, there's some other things we got to talk about. At eighth level, we grab the combat grab feat from first level, because again, there we are, wielding a one-handed melee weapon, hand is free. You make a strike, and it gains the following enhancement and failure. Until the end of your next turn, as long as the target is within your reach, it's flat-footed. On the failure, it's until the start of your next turn. So if you're up there, you can combat grab, strike or harm, and then parry, or if you're going to try to finish it out, if you think you can crit with that flat-footed, or if the rogues are itching to, you know, shank people in the kidneys until dead, combat grab, then he's flat-footed make your routine as normal, strike with your agile weapon, or really, honestly, probably cast harm, because even with a greater penalty, you're targeting touch, you're probably doing a little better, and then parry as the rogues come to stab, it's a really good debuff. Our next two feats come straight from the fighter archetype. First up is fighter resiliency, because we are playing a class that grants eight or fewer hit points per level, and it gives us three additional hit points for every feat you have from the fighter archetype. As you continue selecting feats that increases, we end up with five feats from that archetype, or, you know, an extra 15 hit points, or again, the difference between life and death. It's really strong and it helps. One of the biggest flaws of the melee sorcerer in Pathfinder first edition, because we can just keep padding our HP up, it's really good. Of course, right on the heels of that, we are taking opportunist to get ourselves the attack of opportunity reaction because why not not a lot of things have it in the playtest and it helps combat literally us if we fight another gish who's up in our face and they want to do something with the manipulate trait or a spell with a somatic component and it provokes slap them in the face punish them for being foolish it's really easy for things to just run willy-nilly throughout the board. And to be honest with you, I think that's my only major like meta complaint of the playtest so far is, to be honest, I think more things, if not everything, should have the attack of opportunity reaction to play devil's advocate on this one. It's really easy to play something like a gish because you're not going to get punished for it, which feels good. 
but at the same time, it kind of feels like we're playing on easy mode. And it's really hard for me to visualize running away from something like a slavering hyena and that slavering hyena who wants to eat my face off doesn't try to like take a bite out of me. Just my two cents. Anyway, moving on at 14th, our sorcerer takes its first metamagic feat. That feat is quickened casting. Once per day, it's trigger. You are casting a sorcerer cantrip or spell that is at least two levels lower than the highest sorcerer spell you can cast. The spell must require two or more spell casting actions to cast. It allows you to cheat one of those two actions. It makes the spell cost only one. And it turns out we're not just trying to cast harm forever. There are better spells. One of them is super relevant to the entire build. And if we can turn it into one action instead of two, that means we can heal strike, or it means we can harm strike, or strike strike, or strike parry, on and on. The second metamagic feat we're taking is Overwhelming Spell. When you cast a spell that deals acid, cold, electricity, or fire damage with a maximum of two spellcasting actions, you choose one type of damage that spell deals. The damage ignores the first 10 points of resistance any target has. This applies to any damage the spell deals, which includes persistent damage and any damage caused by an ongoing effect of the spell. Think of wall created by wall of fire. A creature that's immune to the damage is still unaffected, but the easiest way to sideboard against this build, the easiest way to counter it, is to throw non-living things at us that aren't undead. If it's an undead, then we'll just pivot and we'll cast heal and we'll target it and we'll give it the power of the holy light of the god we don't worship against something like a construct. It doesn't work. I thought it did because it didn't outright say in the entries for constructs that they're immune to positive and negative energy and stuff. Now it's just against a living thing. This happens. Well, constructs aren't living, right? So Death robots kill us, which is when we pivot to flame strike, shadow blast, searing light, spells that do fire damage. Really, we were so close to the angelic bloodline because a lot of the spells we're taking are bonus spells. But again, meteor swarm, disintegrate, temporary hit points from eating somebody. Seems really good. Anyway, moving on. Regardless, the fire damage searing light does can cheat through things. And we're going to have those spells anyway to side against constructs. So why not? Anyway, two more feats. At 18th, we're grabbing another fighter feat, our fifth and final, Dueling Repost. It's a reaction, and we have a lot of reactions on this build. A total of three, with Lucky Halfling in the Attack of Opportunity, so choose wisely. But when you're benefiting from Dueling Parry, and someone critically fails a strike against you, and with the Bracers of Armor and High Decks and stuff certainly possible, you get a free melee strike against somebody that misses you, or a disarm action. Your call, either way. Reactions don't use the multiple attack penalty, so if he misses you with that plus two, just, you know, ram your sword into his gut, ram your hatchet into his gut, take a blunt object and beat him in the gut. Perhaps the face, your call. It's damage on his turn. It makes us more reactive. It helps us play that long game. And of course, our capstone could be nothing if it wasn't Archmage's Might, which gives us access to 10th level spells. Wellspring spell seems cool, but adding a somatic casting is not something I'm really down with. And really the 10th level spell slots that we pick up can just be a heightened harm, right? That seems good. Now, let's talk about spells. Like I said, heal and harm are bread and butter for us. We're obviously taking more spells than these, but we're going to focus on the ones that we want to be casting the most. As a divine caster, we do have access, I will say though, to things like breath of life, restoration, and we well and truly can be the party's healer. Cure the poisons, cure the diseases, get rid of the debuffs. We can, and if that's you, do it. But we're not trying to build a healer today. We're trying to build a gish and there's a lot of spells on this list that the Gish really just loves. The first of which, Vampiric Touch. It's 3d6 negative damage to a creature, double damage on a crit, of course, and you gain temporary hit points equal to the negative damage the target takes after applying resistances and stuff. You lose any remaining temporary hit points after a minute, but when we heighten this bad boy, the damage increases by a d6, which means what we're healing also increases by a d6. Again, it's the long game. If we're getting hurt really bad, our combat turn might be Vampiric Touch, get some temporary hit points, then heal for some actual hit points. Also, it's a lot of damage thrown around. Man, wouldn't it be cool if we could throw it at a lot of people at once? Oh yeah, Vampiric Exsanguination at spell level six 
does the same thing, except it's 10d6 negative damage in a 30-foot cone. Based on fort saves, as normal, success is half, crit is none, failure is full, crit fail is double, and you gain half as many hit points as the maximum damage done. Heighten this plus two, the damage goes up by 3d6. It starts at spell level six. Heighten it to eight, 13d6, heighten it to 10, that's 16d6 thrown out at a lot of people. And you get half as the max amount of damage, or 8d6-ish, give or take, back not as temporary hit points, but you gain half of them back. So you could Vampiric Exsanguination, and then if someone survives and they're close enough for you to touch Vampiric, touch them, use Quicken Spell so you can burn an action, gain a bunch of hit points back, stay in the fight. Of course, they might have regeneration. Of course, they might have ways to heal themselves, but we're not worried about that so much as we're worried about hurting them while maintaining us in the span of one turn. I feel like a lot of the times it's these two spells that we're choosing to spontaneously heighten. Heal and harm are also really good choices. Really, you just kind of got to know during your daily prep what you're going to be doing, what you're going up against. If it needs to be searing light that we're buffing because, again, armies of robots, then so much the better. We can totally do so. The same is true for a wonderful little spell called Shadow Blast, which is our shadow evocation, essentially. You choose Acid, Bludgeoning, Cold, Electricity, Fire, Piercing, or Slashing, and pick a 30-foot cone, 15-foot burst within 120 feet of you, or 50-foot line to do 5d8 points of damage to the specified type with a reflex or will, your choice for the various degrees of damage heightening does extra d8s and that's super good if you're fighting things with lots of resistances just okay yeah here's a line of quasi real swords that are going to appear and just stab you in the gut a bunch and then i'll stab you with my sword for the third action ha ha before we go on to talk about the items real quick before we sign off i have to correct myself from the ranger video i didn't realize this was a thing i hadn't looked at the glossary but we'll talk about it now. The potent trait appears on all of our items that can buff our ability scores to 18 or plus 2, your choice. A potent item grants this benefit only the first time it's invested within a 24-hour period, and a character is only benefiting from one potent item at a time. So I can't, like, invest the charisma thing and then take it off and invest the dex thing and blase. We literally have to choose one in the Pathfinder playtest. So as we're leveling our ability scores up, we're prioritizing strength, con wisdom and charisma charisma for our spell dc's strength because our touch attack is actually punch you and sometimes we might actually punch you con for hit points wisdom so we don't get mind controlled it's got to be the anklets of alacrity because dexterity is our armor class and our reflex save sure we can be in plate mail but eventually we're gonna switch over to the bracers of armor because mage armor does not appear on the divine spell list so the more dex the better there's a couple of pretty cool items in addition to, like, the keen enchantment on your weapon, which is a 19 to 20 critical now instead of a 20 critical, though the 19 must hit. And Bracers of Armor, of course, because that's our Cloak of Resistance, and eventually, in theory, we can probably dexterity out of a lot of the big armor requirements. First up, it's the Spell Duelist Gloves. They enhance the flow of magic through your fingertips, and they grant the wearer an item bonus to non-weapon melee touch attack rolls. Once per day, you can activate the gloves to cast a specific spell. Touch of idiocy on the lesser, shocking grasp on the standard, uncontrollable dance on the supreme purple worm sting on the greater. But really, we're just looking at the bonus to our touch attacks. Super good. The spell storing enchantment has returned to us. A spellcaster can spend one minute to cast a third level or lower spell into the weapon, storing it for later. The spell must be able to target a creature other than you. When you wield a spell storing weapon, you immediately know the name and level of the spell, so if you happen to like find one in a dungeon. When you activate the rune, you unleash the stored spell, treating the target of the triggering attack as the target of the spell, using a spell roll modifier of plus 20, DC 30 if necessary. Wow, that's really good. This empties the spell from the weapon and allows the spell to be cast into it again. Of course, it costs a point of resonance, but we're the sorcerer. We don't mind. Put a two-action spell like, oh, I don't know, Vampiric Touch at third level, not heightened, into your weapon. Cast Vampiric Touch, heightened to bejesus and back, get all the hit points. 
use quicken casting so that was one action then attack get your attack damage in and then trigger the spell storing rune to more or less get five actions for the cost of three it seems really good and again i really like that we can gish with anybody in the playtest this build is one that i'm actually really excited to play i hope i get the chance to at some point because it seems to me because it seems really strong to me we stay in the game longer with the use of gaining temporary hit points and having access to heal while being able to harm the bad guys, do damage to, again, temporary hit points, and also be good with a sword, and only really a little worse than, like, the fighter or barbarian next to us. But what do you guys think? Are you gishing in the playtest? Is that a good enough substitute for the Magus for you? And are there any other spell lists or classes you want to see me build as a spell sorty gishy magusy kind of thing if so throw in the comments we'll get right on them actually it's another divine spellcaster next thank you guys so much for watching by request the next episode of min maxing for fun and profit is a cleric optimization video and it's going to be a cleric of gorum that's right kids we're casting greatsword next saturday <laughs>